Okay, so in the final session of this meeting, I would like to highlight a few papers that were published in 2022. And <coughs> I'd like to confess, I chose them, and I chose them for various different reasons. And I apologize in advance if I didn't choose either your paper or your favorite paper. But I want to start saying that, again, this meeting definitely contributed to the mission of uh, the World Kidney Day in 2022, where the mission was that knowledge gaps needed to be bridged, uh, education needed to be fostered in order to improve kidney care. And I, I am absolutely convinced that the organizers of these meetings have achieved this. So I've chosen a couple of papers from different areas and I've chosen papers that deal with epidemiology, diagnostics, clinical trials, and some consensus statements. And within the limits of the time, clearly this is very selective number of papers and choice of papers. I want to start with a clinical trial related to fluids, because we've obviously debated for more than 10 years whether buffered solutions may be better than saline in critically ill patients and whether buffered solutions are more protective compared to saline. In 2022, we had an addition to the existing number of landmark trials. And as you know, up till 2021, several landmark trials got published with differing results. So we have this, had the split trial, which showed no difference in outcome between patients receiving saline versus balanced solutions. We had SMART and SALT-ED, both showed a difference with regards to MAKE30, so a composite outcome, uh, suggesting that balanced solutions were more protective. And then we had the BASICS trial from South America in 2021, showing no difference in outcome. In 2022, the PLUS trial was published. And this again was a large randomized controlled trial conducted in Australia and New Zealand, looking at the role of balanced solutions in patients admitted to the intensive care unit. Now the team had aimed to enroll 8,000 patients, but because of COVID and the challenges in research, they stopped after 5,037 patients. And at that time, the analysis confirmed that further recruitment was, would not change the outcome. So they stopped uh, <coughs> prematurely, but uh, the results are considered to be robust. They looked at 90-day mortality in patients who had been randomized to either saline or buffered solutions throughout their stay in the ICU. And they showed no difference in the primary outcome, which was 90 days. There was no difference in mortality. And there was also no difference in their renal outcomes. And when they looked at subgroups, based on the fact that people, that it's often argued that particular subgroups may benefit more or less from, say, from buffered solutions, as you can see here, there is no statistically significant difference in any of these pre-chosen groups. So the, uh, the researchers concluded that the use of a balanced solution, plasmalite, for instance, in critically ill patients did not result in a lower risk of death or a lower risk of acute kidney injury than using saline. So we have another major landmark study added to the already existing number of trials, but no, not giving us a clear, definite answer. And so the investigators of the PLUS trial proceeded immediately to updating the meta-analysis, and up, an existing meta-analysis, and included the results of the BASICS trial from South America and the new results of the PLUS trial. And so this led to a meta-analysis now with data of more than 35,000 patients enrolled in 13 randomized controlled trials. And when you analyze the data, again, there is no statistically significant clear result. With regards to 90-day mortality, the results are in favor of balanced solutions, but not statistically significant. So using balanced crystalloids, 
compared to saline, will result in a 9% relative reduction in death or up to a possible 1% relative increase in the risk of death. With regards to acute kidney injury, it's very similar. Using balanced solutions as opposed to saline is associated with a potential 9% relative reduction in acute kidney injury, but up to a possible 1% relative increase in the risk of acute kidney injury. And this is where we are at the moment with balanced solutions versus saline. It is unlikely that we will have more randomized controlled trials because we've already had so many and more than 35,000 patients have been included. So the investigators and researchers of these individual trials are currently putting their results together and sub-analyzing different groups to see whether maybe possibly particular sub-cohorts benefit more or less from one group. What we do know is that, for instance, patients with trauma uh, come to harm from balanced solutions and benefit more from saline. But it may also be that there are other subgroups who benefit more from one type than the other. So this is where we are at the moment with regards to fluids. And the PLUS trial certainly contributed to the existing uh, knowledge. Another study which I picked is a study related to timing of renal replacement therapy. And Professor Mehta has already given an excellent talk on the uh, decision-making process related to timing of renal replacement therapy. As you all know, we've had five landmark trials in the last few years, of which one showed a better outcome with early initiation. This was the Elaine trial. And all other four showed no real difference in mortality uh, between early versus accelerate, early versus delayed initiation. So a team at the Brigham Hospital in the US went further and tried to explore whether individual decision making was more beneficial. And they also went further, and this is the reason why I chose this, is they used uh, digital tools to help the decision making process. The aim was to evaluate whether the use of an AKI, standardized clinical assessment and management plan, in patients considered for kidney replacement therapy or renal replacement therapy, changed the outcomes, especially mortality, length of stay, or use of renal replacement therapy. And as part of their uh, framework and decision-making plan, and also to, tr to uh, program the digital tool, they decided that there were certain criteria for initiating renal replacement therapy, and they're listed here, and they are the standard uh, criteria which are often listed and being considered for renal replacement therapy, all in line with possible absolute criteria. So severe acidosis, severe fluid <coughs> overload, need for, for high levels of oxygen, and oliguria. Now, uh, this decision tool was created, and I'll show you the tool here. So the team was asked to consider, uh, to ask themselves whether renal replacement therapy uh, was considered in patients to not only extend the life, or whether there was any chance that it may, uh, was unlikely to result in a meaningful quality of life. If the decision was uh, yes, that it may extend life and was unlikely to cause harm, as if the decision was yes, uh, no, sorry, then they were asked to, to proceed. If the decision was that they, there was a chance that it was, would not really change quality of life and um, have any meaningful outcomes, then they were asked to consider once more whether renal replacement therapy was indeed uh, necessary and should be used. So they were led to the, section, the question number two on your left. As I said, if the, the answer was no, then they proceeded and essentially indicated the particular reasons for the individual patient. And then the digital tool would uh, give some suggestions for or, or against initiation of renal replacement therapy. This trial was conducted in a way where the, they used the tool for a period of four to six weeks and then stopped using the tool for four to six weeks where only clinical decision making was uh, done. This study was conducted in nine ICUs, all affiliated with the Brigham Women's Hospital. And by doing this, 
they really didn't find any difference in mortality. These were patients considered for renal replacement therapy, but using this digital tool to, to support the decision-making process didn't change patients' survival or outcome. But what it did do was it reduced the length of stay in ICU, the length of stay in hospital, and it reduced the uh, use of renal replacement therapy in patients who were considered to have a futile prognosis. So the authors concluded that digital tools like this one, for instance, could help clinicians at the bedside and that the use of these tools, including the usual criteria for the decision-making process, was associated with a reduced length of stay and a reduced use of renal replacement therapy in patients who, whose prognosis was considered to be not good. I chose this because clearly it helps us, I think it does help us as we move forward towards uh, individualized decision-making process, but it also shows the uh, opportunities of digital tools in clinical decision-making. The next study which I picked was a study conducted in Canada, and it focuses again on contrast-associated acute kidney injury and the our intention to reduce harm from contrast. And this is a very exciting study, which incorporates many things, not only the randomized controlled uh, design, but also the incorporation of education, digital tools, and uh, quality improvement metrics. So the team around Matthew James in uh, Edmonton uh, aimed to determine whether a multifaceted intervention strategy was effective to prevent acute kidney injury after coronary angiography or PCIs, so after arterial administration of contrast. And it was a step wedge cluster randomized clinical trial, which included randomization to either usual control uh, uh, practice versus intervention strategy. And the intervention was multifaceted. So cardiologists who were randomized to the intervention arm then received education. They received an educational pack about acute kidney injury, the impact, the long-term consequences, the um, financial burden, and the individual burden on, on patients' well-being. They also received help by computerized clinical decision support on the amount of contrast which had been used during the PCI or angiography, uh, they help, they, the, the tool helped them making sure that as the, the smallest amount of contrast was used, they received warnings if their contrast volume uh, had exceeded a particular limit, and they received a feedback loop where throughout this particular period, they had regular feedbacks, feedback, feedback on the compliance with the protocol. So whether they were regularly using more volume than normal or than suggested, they received feedback on their general practice on checking renal function, and they received feedback on the number of patients who had developed acute kidney injury. In contrast, patients in the, uh, sorry, cardiologists in the, cardio in the control arm just practiced PCI or coronary angiography as usual. The team managed to uh, enroll cardiologists from different centers. And in total, more than 7,800 procedures were included in this analysis. Now, obviously, large, many of these procedures were performed by the same cardiologists. In, but in total, they had data from 7,820 patients. And they showed that this intervention, just using simple things like education, quality improvement, digital tools, feedback, and as I said, importantly, education, education of, the cardiolo of our cardiology colleagues, led to a statistically significant difference in the number of patients with acute kidney injury after coronary angiography or PCI. Now, the absolute difference was only 1.4%, as you can see on your right. But given the large number of people who get 
a coronary angiogram or a PCI every day worldwide. This is clearly a very important result. And it was done without major new tests or new novel drugs or new biomarkers, which a lot of people can't afford. And the focus here really was intervention, uh, sorry, education, quality improvement, and regular feedback. I'm now moving from adults to children. And the reason I'm moving to children is twofold. One is that uh, pediatric practice has always been Professor Meta's uh, emphasis in the CRIT conference. And so the pediatricians have always been included, and they have clearly been included in this meeting. So we, I'd like to include pediatric literature. And secondly, I would like to celebrate the first pediatric APKI, which was conducted uh, and then published last year. And it was really a major milestone paper where more than 40 uh, clinicians with uh, p interest in pediatrics and uh, patients and patient representatives were included and met to develop pediatric specific recommendations related to acute kidney injury. And importantly, these are children either at risk of acute kidney injury or with acute kidney injury who in a few years time may be our patients. And the team uh, <coughs> identified many common um, uh, areas of interest and many knowledge gaps. And one of the key uh, consensus of the meeting was that acute kidney injury in children, as in adults, needed to be differentiated much better. And that there were so many factors that impacted the phenotype of acute kidney injury in children. And the key in pediatric nephrology needed to be the uh, identification of specific AKI phenotypes in order to identify interventions, strategies, and mechanisms to support children and, and future adults. They also identified areas where pediatric nephrology is very, very, very different from adult nephrology. And clearly, pediatricians deal with so many aspects that are uh, not so relevant for us. For instance, the development of, children, of, of kidneys uh, during um, fetal life, the impact of uh, environmental factors like nutrition, the impact of the, the, the parents' uh, well-being, and also potentially <coughs> sex as a biological variable there was evidence that uh, AKI in girls appeared to be different from AKI in boys. Now, a lot of this is still at a very early phase. It's very exciting, but it also clearly revealed the gaps in our knowledge which need to be explored. Because these are factors which may well impact the future and the prognosis of AKI, and therefore the AKI which we then see as adult clinicians. Now, with regards to the atki style recommendations and consensus statements, there was consensus in several areas, and I've listed them here. There was consensus that um, more epidemiological work needed to be done, in particular in these high-risk areas, so children with chronic liver disease, children with, with genetic disorders. There was also consensus that the definition of acute kidney injury needed to be broadened and that biomarkers in whatever form, either proteins, imaging, molecular testing, uh, had, a, had, an, had a strong role and um, may need and should be included in future definitions and criteria. There was consensus that fluid overload was harmful in children. In fairness, it was the children, it was a pediatric practice that highlighted the adult clinicians to the importance of fluid overload before we recognize this. And they emphasize the importance of, and the harmful effect of fluid overload in children, and that much more needed to be done to avoid fluid overload using digital tools, technology, education. With regards to kidney replacement therapy, they acknowledge that they don't re that pediatric nephrologists and pediatric intensive care clinicians do not really have pediatric pediatric-specific extracorporeal therapies. 
They do not have therapies that are really designed for the neonates and then some for, for, for uh, adoles adolescents. And often they just borrow machines and equipment from the adult world and much more needed to be done in collaboration with uh, companies and uh, uh, commercial uh, partners. I've already said that uh, our understanding of the development of, kidney, of kidneys before birth and after birth needs to be uh, explored much more and that much more research is necessary. And the uh, patients and patient representatives in the meeting emphasize the importance of involving patients and their relatives in future decision making, in guidelines, and the integration of checklists. So these were the consensus areas, but there were also many, many areas where gaps in knowledge were identified related to epidemiology, our understanding of acute kidney injury in children in countries with less resources, the importance of other diagnostic tools, and uh, the various gaps related to in the, in the research arena. And clearly much more work is necessary. But this was a landmark paper, and I would encourage you to read it, which has many uh, research suggestions and will hopefully lead us to the next steps in advancing clinical practice. I've also chosen two papers related to epidemiology, and I want to start with uh, Professor Srisawat's CAKI study, uh, one of the, another uh, sub-analysis of this very large, impressive database. As you know, the CAKI study is a multi-center database uh, with data from patients admitted to adult ICUs in Thailand, Laos, and Indonesia. And uh, Professor Srisawat has already successfully published various papers and highlighted the epidemiology of acute kidney injury in countries with less resources. And in this paper, they looked at the outcome of patients with a combination of acute kidney injury and acute respiratory failure. As you can see here, they had data from th these three countries, an impressive number of data, which were then, were then analyzed, so more than 5,400 data, uh, patient data. And using these data, they established different trajectories and different outcomes. And as you can see here, patients who had concurrent acute kidney injury and acute respiratory failure, so the people in purple, had the worst prognosis and the highest risk of dying compared, for instance, to patients without acute kidney injury and without respiratory failure. And then with regards to those patients who either had acute renal failure alone or acute kidney injury alone, again, there were differences. And then in patients who had a combination of acute kidney injury and renal failure uh, and uh, respiratory failure, it didn't matter whether acute kidney injury had occurred first or whether acute respiratory failure had occurred first. So very exciting new data related to the epidemiology of acute kidney injury. And correctly, they concluded that critically ill patients with acute kidney injury and acute respiratory failure were firstly at high risk of death and that different patterns uh, had been detected, which clearly need more work in future because some of them may be amenable to interventions and strategies. The other paper related to epidemiology, which I chose, was this one, Acute Kidney Injury in Patients Treated with Immune Checkpoint Inhibitors. It was led, a study led by uh, Dr. Leaf from the US. And I'm ch I've chosen it because it was highlighted as the paper of the year by the International Society of Oncology in 2022. And they thought this was such a landmark paper. And to me, this is a really good sign. The fact that oncologists, international oncologists, chose a, chose a paper as a paper of, as their first, as a best paper of the year, which deals with acute kidney injury, in my mind, is the sign that we can all collaborate and learn from each other. And as we've already heard yesterday by the fantastic talk on acute kidney injury in oncology patients, cancer patients are at high risk of acute kidney injury. And this is an area where oncologists, hematologists, and nephrologists, and intensive care clinicians need to work together to understand things better. So having uh, the fact that the International Society of Oncology chose this paper and Shruti Gupta as the first author 
was invited to present it is, in my mind, a fantastic uh, statement and a fantastic acknowledgement of nephrology in the world of oncology. But to give you the results, uh, Dr. Leave and team and Shruti Gupta as the key investigator collected data of patients, cancer patients who had received immune checkpoint inhibitors in uh, 10 different countries. Now, obviously, immune checkpoint inhibitors are currently, uh, have changed the, the prognosis and, uh, of cancer patients and led to major advances. And they were con generally considered to be renal friendly. And uh, Dr. Leaf and Dr. Gupta, Professor Gupta challenged this and want, really wanted to know whether patients had a risk of acute kidney injury or not. So they collected the, the data from cancer centers in different countries. And they compared immune checkpoint inhibitor associated acute kidney injury with the outcome of patients who had also received these drugs but hadn't developed acute kidney injury. Now, importantly, cancer patients are also obviously at risk of acute kidney injury for hundreds of reasons, many reasons. So for the purpose of this study and the whole project and the whole uh, study uh, program, they defined immune checkpoint inhibitor associated acute kidney injury as listed here. It's defined as either an increase in creatinine by 100% or receiving RIT, or a 50% rise together with either interstitial nephritis on renal biopsy or a clinical decision to hold the immune checkpoint inhibitor because of AKI or a conscious decision to give steroid therapy for acute kidney injury. So we can argue about these criteria, whether they really define immune checkpoint inhibitor induced acute kidney injury or not, but that is, these were the criteria as they were chosen because we don't have any alternative criteria. And this is, these are the criteria the team has worked with for several years. And when you do that, then uh, it appears that acute kidney injury is, uh, is called, it does occur in this patient group. And the risk factors for acute kidney injury as a result of the use of immune checkpoint inhibitors is higher in patients with poor kidney function, and higher in patients with, who take a PPI, and in patients who have had either in the past or at the same time some other extra renal adverse effects events of related to immune checkpoint inhibitors. So rashes, um, uh, respiratory problems, and so forth. So these are the risk factors which were identified in this study. It was also shown that it, the acute kidney injury in this patient group can occur really at any time, quite a long, up to 80 weeks after the initial initiation. Some patients were labeled as having immune checkpoint inhibitor associated acute kidney injury. So the, the, when it occurs, it, it doesn't occur immediately. It can, it can occur pretty late. And it can also take quite a while to recover kidney function again, as shown here. And the factors that uh, predict renal recovery were listed here. And it was really the treatment with steroids, which in this meta-analysis seem to be beneficial and induce re or promote renal recovery after this onset. So the uh, nephrologists concluded and presented at the annual meeting of the International Society of Oncology in the US that patients who developed immune checkpoint inhibitor acute kidney injury were more, those with pre-existing uh, chronic kidney disease, those who were taking a PPI, and those who had extra renal side effects had a higher risk. Uh, the prognosis in general was considered to be good because two-thirds of patients recovered kidney function again, but it may take a while, it may take weeks. Okay, and this brings me to the end of my search, but I want to end with one study that, again, uh, should, I think, trigger excitement and uh, will hopefully get, get us to further studies and potentially also new diagnostic tools in future. So Professor Belomo looked at the role of measuring urinary oxygen tension, PO2 in urine. And the background to this is that obviously the medulla is usually hypoxic. 
in health, our kidneys, provided we have normal kidney function, work well, and our tubular cells manage to do an incredible job despite the fact that they are in a very hypoxic milieu. The PO2 in the medulla is normally less than three kilopascal. In conditions with acute kidney injury, it is thought that the PO2 is falls even further, and this may contribute to tubular damage. We now have tools available that can measure urinary PO2 reliably without contamination from uh, the external environment or the air. And in this uh, experiment, Professor Belomo and team used a model of gram-negative sepsis in sheep and induced gram-negative sepsis. And they then measured the PO2 in the medulla of these sheep's kidneys and the PO2 in the urine. And there was a clear correlation. And as you can see here, the correlation seemed very good to the point that the team concluded that this may well be a promising tool in future to monitor the adequacy of renal medullary oxygenation to use as a warning sign in situations where the medulla may be even more, may be become ischemic, and that future work was could, should, be, should explore how to use this as a potential indicator and marker and monitor of kidney function in critical illness. And that's where I would like to end. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>